Um, but it's so good to be here today and to join you uh, this morning as we just dive into the Word. You know, we're starting a new series called Sometimes All the Time. Everybody turn to your neighbor and tell them, Sometimes All the Time. Sometimes All the Time. And we're looking into the book of Psalms. Uh, we're going to be looking and drawing out three Psalms uh, to just kind of see what God is saying to us, how He's challenging us. But I think it's really, really apt that we're having this series now. Because last weekend we had worship encounter, and as Pastor Jay mentioned at the start of our service, um, it was a powerful time of just remembering who God is, of just worshiping Him together as a body of Christ. But it was also a reminder for us. It was like God gave us a couple of words um, through that time of worship. And it was this, number one, that we are to make room for God. Right? We're to make room for God. And, and I thought that was amazing because that kind of followed up with our previous message the week before that, which was just uh, opening the doors of our lives to God. And, and then there was another word which is found in Leviticus chapter 6, verse 8 to 9. Uh, and it speaks about this place of don't let the fire go out. Don't let the fire go out. Now, as we receive that word, the question we have to ask ourselves though is, how do we do that? How do we make sure that the fire of God or the fire at the altar doesn't go out? Now, we know that a part of that is that we have to continue this life of worship, and worship is more than just um, singing a few songs. It is a lifestyle. It's the way that we live. And, and I think it's apt because as we look at the book of Psalms, the book of Psalms is really just a collection of writings, of songs, of psalms that gives us some handles as to how we can keep this fire burning. How we can make sure that the fire of God doesn't burn out. So how do we do this? By setting aside time for God. We have to set aside time for God every day of our lives to make sure that the fire doesn't go out. Again, you look at Leviticus chapter 6, um, the priests and the Levites, they had to make sure that the fire doesn't go out. How do they do that? They had to go to the altar every day every hour just to make sure and make sure that nothing went wrong to make sure that it's still burning to, to just kind of monitor how much time they had left and, and just so that they could get prepared and ready to keep the fire going and it's the same with us how do we make sure that the fire of god doesn't burn out in our lives how do we make sure that the fire on the altar of our lives doesn't burn out by setting aside time every day of our lives to make sure that the fire doesn't go out. But what do we do? What do we do during those times? Well, let's go back to the book of Psalms. Because the book of Psalms shows us what we can do. You know, a lot of the time people say, you know what, spend time every day, read your Bible, pray every day, right? And then you read your Bible, then you pray, and sometimes it gets mundane. Sometimes you just go through the motion. Sometimes you're doing the same thing over and over again. Right, you know, the first minute, you're just going to say a short prayer, thank God for the day, it's, from minute two to five, you're going to be reading a passage of scripture and, and, and you just keep going. Sometimes it can get so routine and we begin to ask ourselves, now how do we keep this fire from burning out? How do we continue encountering God? How do we continue meeting with Him day in and day out? And that's what we're going to be looking at over the course of this series because as we dive into the book of Psalms, we're going to explore and understand and glean from the psalmist what are some other things, practical things that we can do in the times that we set aside for God? Now, there's another thing that you have to understand though, because as we spend time with God, it's not just about spending time with God sometimes. It's about spending time with God all the time. And so as we, as we look at this, the reason why we've titled our series Sometimes All the Time is because God is calling us to have sometimes all the time. God is calling us to have these times where we're alone with Him, not just sometimes, not just once in a while, but all the time. And so how do we do this? Now again, we're just going to be kicking us off from Psalm 13. Now if you look at the book of Psalms, there are a lot of Psalms, right? And we're going to be picking one from each 50. That's kind of our, our aim. Uh, so we've got one from within Psalm 1 to 50. We've got one between Psalm 50 to 100, and then we've got one after 100, okay? Now, some of you may say, okay, but, but you got like, then what about after some 150? Um, we only got three weeks, lah, so we, we can't stop there. Anyway, there aren't many after that. And, uh, and so as we, as we dive into this, turn with me to your Bibles to Psalm 13, reading from verse 1. We're going to be reading the entire psalm together, um, verse 1 to 6. Now, this is a psalm that was written by King David. In fact, we're not really sure if he was king during this point in time, and so we'll just call him David for the sake of that. And David wrote this psalm, and it starts like this. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? 
How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Now consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. Now, if you have a highlighter, you can highlight it in your, in your Bible app. I want you to highlight the word, but. You know, but I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Now, the first thing that we're going to be diving into for the rest of our time today, how do we spend time with God? What does it look like to have some times all the time? What does it look like to keep the fire burning? Well, I've titled my message just Keep It Real. The first thing we have to do if we want to set aside time with God, if we want to spend time with God, is that we have to keep it real. We have to keep it real with God. In fact, when you read the Psalms, it's actually really interesting because the psalmist is very, very real with God. There are things in the Psalms where it speaks about, oh, if I wish you could crush my enemies. I wish, I wish you could destroy not just them, but destroy their babies. I wish, you know, and he gets really authentic. He gets really genuine. In fact, sometimes you read the Psalms and you're wondering, wait, could, can you really say that to God? Because, you know, sometimes when we approach God, we feel like there's a textbook way to approach God. We have to always, like, be prim and proper. We, we, have, to, we, have, to, we have to say nice things. You know, we, we can't, oh, God forbid, if we have any negative thoughts in our mind. And, and we kind of approach God through that manner. But it's interesting because when you read the Psalms, the Psalmists are always very real with God. In fact, if you just read the passage we just read, David was as real as he could be with God. And the reason why we want to explore this subject is because sometimes I believe that, that as Christians, you know, when we spend time with God, we can either be very superficial or, or we're just not real with Him. So sometimes we're not real at all. We just give Him all the right answers. We, we, we're just textbook with God. And then at other times, we keep it real, but at a very superficial level. We don't, we don't really go deep when it comes to God. We don't really share with God what's going on and, and, and how we feel and, and, and the things that are plaguing our mind. But the truth is this, because we have to understand this. God can only be real to us if we are real to Him. Let me say it again. God can only be real with us if we are real with him. This means that if we are not real with God, no matter how real God wants to be to you in your situation, he won't because we've not given him access into that space. Do you hear what I'm saying? You know, if King David or if David didn't say these things and didn't share how he felt with God, then no matter what God was trying to do, he wouldn't meet him where David was at because David had yet to pour it out to the Lord. You see, God can only be real to us if we are real with Him. And so, as we dive through this passage, as we look through Psalm 13, I pray that we'll begin to glean a couple of things that we can do and apply into our lives to help us be more real with God. Are, are you ready? Now, if you're ready, will you just join me as we commit this time to the Lord together in prayer? God, we pray that you will just help us be real with you. Amen. Now, Three things, three things that we actually see uh, as we dive through this passage about how we can be real with God. Number one, the first thing that we have to do, and the first thing that David did is this. We have to share how we feel with God. We have to share how we feel. Now, when I say share how we feel, I'm not talking about our cares and our concerns. I'm talking about our cries and our complaints. They're slightly different. What I mean by this, you see, sometimes our cares and our concerns, these are things that, that revolve around our circumstances. But God is interested in our circumstances, but He's more interested in our feelings and our emotions. And the challenge is this. Oftentimes when we come before God and we pray, we normally present to God our circumstances as opposed to our emotions. 
We normally present to God how, what we're going through as opposed to how we feel about what we're going through. And there's a difference between the two. In fact, I find it interesting because when you read Psalm chapter 13, Nowhere. In fact, the scholars, even the biblical scholars today, they actually don't have any idea when David wrote this psalm. Some say it may have been during the time when Saul was attacking him and trying to persecute him and trying to kill him, but we're not very sure. In fact, the entire psalm doesn't allude to the circumstances that David was in. It alludes to how he felt about the circumstances. And I think it's really, really interesting. So again, just to paint us a picture, what was David going through? What did David go through? So what David went through, now again, the Bible isn't clear, but there's some guesses, intelligent guesses that we can make about what David went through. Number one, maybe it was during the time where he was belittled by his brothers. He had already been been anointed king, but maybe the brothers, you know, they kind of treated him as the youngest. I mean, he was the youngest. And so he was kind of like their slave. He had to go do all the different things, the things that they didn't want to do, he had to do. In fact, when he showed up uh, to, to, to the battlefield, his brothers belittled him again, saying, why are you here? Did you just come to just watch and see what's going on? Did you just come to, to give eye power or just to become an audience? You know, you, you should be at home tending the sheep. He may have written this psalm during that period of time where he was belittled by his brothers. But it may not even have been then. It could have been a time where he was persecuted by Saul, as I mentioned earlier, when Saul was out for his life. Another situation in which he may have written this was maybe it was during a time where he was judged by God. You know, remember the time when when he slept with Bathsheba and then he ended up making arrangements so that Bathsheba's husband could get killed? And then when he is finally exposed by the prophet Nathan, The judgment of God comes upon him and he loses his firstborn child. It may have been written during this time when he was judged by God, or maybe, just maybe, he may have written this psalm when he was betrayed by his son, Absalom. When his son decided to come for the throne at the expense of his life. Maybe we're not very, very sure as to when he wrote this. But why am I spending time about this? Because... Again, when you look at how we spend time with God, oftentimes we, we spend a lot of time talking about our circumstances with God. During our quiet time, during our prayers, God, this, this is happening, this is going on. And we spend so much time there. But when you look at how David spent time with God, not once do you see what he was going through in this psalm. It was just how he felt. Now, what did David feel? How did David feel? Now, how David felt was this. In fact, when you read through Psalm 13, we get glimpses of this all throughout the Scriptures. So in verse 1, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? It's very, very clear that, at least from David's point of view, David felt forgotten. He felt forgotten by God. What else do we see, though? Because in the second part of that verse, He says this, how long will you hide your face from me? He didn't just feel forgotten. He felt abandoned. So he's saying, God, have you forgotten me? But but maybe maybe you've remembered me. Maybe you remember who I am. And and now you've just abandoned me. Now you just don't care. Because if you've not forgotten me, then you just don't care. But he didn't just stop there. And then he, he went on to say, how long must I take counsel in my soul? He may have just felt stuck. Have you ever been in that place before where you're just stuck in your own mind, you're stuck in your own brain, you've got something you need to sort out in your life and you're just thinking the worst time to get stuck in your own brain is just as you're about to go to sleep. How long? How, how long do I have to take counsel by myself? How long do I have to keep talking to myself and trying to figure this out by myself? I'm tired of hearing my own voice. I just feel like I'm stuck. There's nothing that I can do to get out of this mess. But he doesn't stop there and... and not just take counsel in my own soul, but have sorrow in my heart all the day. Maybe he just felt depressed. It makes it even worse, right, when you understand what kind of caused that sorrow. How long must I take counsel in my soul? And when I take counsel in my soul, now I have sorrow in my heart all day. And how long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Maybe in that season, he just felt not just forgotten, abandoned, stuck, depressed. He felt defeated. 
Maybe he felt all of these things. In fact, when you read this passage here, he felt every single one of those things and he shared it with God. Now, what am I trying to get to here? I want you to look at every single one of that list from how David felt. How many times have you felt like that in your life? The next question is, how often have you told that to God? See, the thing that we understand through this passage, when we read just the first two verses, is that God is interested in the state of our hearts more than he is the state in the state of what's happening around us. See, God is more interested in the state of our hearts than the state of what is happening around us. And yet, oftentimes, we come to God with our circumstances as opposed to our emotions and our feelings. But you see, this is where the challenge lies because the challenge is this. Oftentimes, it's a lot easier for us to identify our circumstances than it is to identify our emotions, than to identify how we feel. You know, it's so much easier to just spend time with God and just tell God all our problems. Tell God all, everything that's going on, our circumstances, the things that are happening, and just, just say, you know what, God, these are the things that's going on, and, and, and to leave it. But to really get in tune with our emotions, how many of you know we're not as in tune with our emotions as we should be? When we're with God and when we're not with God. Oftentimes, we, it, it comes like this. You know, we, we talk with different ones. I'm sure you've had this conversation before. And oftentimes, it's a complaint from the ladies. Um, the ladies will always say, I always ask my husband how he feels, and he never tells me how he feels. He always tells me what he thinks. Right? They, 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 or they always just come up with the answers and the solutions. Why? Because it's hard to get in touch with your emotions. Sometimes more often for guys than, than for ladies, but it's the same both ways because sometimes when it comes to God, it's hard for us to get in tune with our emotions. And so if it's hard for us to get in tune with our emotions, it's hard for us to share those emotions with God. And the thing is this, if we can't share our emotions with God, can't, God can't meet us in that emotional place. And so what does God become? God just becomes a thought. God becomes a list of principles. God becomes a list of do's and don'ts. God becomes an answering machine that answers our prayers and answers the cry of our circumstances as opposed to the cry of our hearts. This is why it's so important for us to get in touch with our emotions. But why, why is it so difficult? Can I tell you, oftentimes it's just because we don't want to set aside time for God. Let, let me put it to us this way. To set aside five minutes for God every day is already hard enough in itself. Let me go another layer down to try and get in touch with your emotions in five minutes of a day is even harder. And so what do we do? If we can just check off the list of spending time with God without checking off the list to get in touch with our emotions, we'll check it off. And it's so hard. You know, the other day when I was spending time with God, I was rushing, because now I'm in a reserve, it's rushing to do what I also don't know. But, but I was rushing, and, and, and so I didn't really spend as much time. I, I just checked it out, read my Bible, say a prayer, just say, God, I want to be sensitive to what you're doing. But I didn't set enough time to get in touch with what was going on in my heart. And it's like that with us. It's so hard to do that. Others of us, sometimes we just don't want to go there. Because we're afraid of what we'll find when we really dig deep enough to how we feel. And so sometimes we just rather not deal with it. And so what do we do? We just cover it up, go along our daily business, check off the list, say we spend time with God, but not get in touch with how we feel. That's the thing that I appreciate the most about David in the Bible. He was someone who wasn't afraid to get in touch with his emotions and his feelings. And he spent a lot of time doing that. I think he, he practiced that when he was looking after the sheep. That's my guess. Because what else can you do? No handphone, no iPhone, no Samsung, nothing. You know? He's just looking at the trees, counting sheep, spending time with God, getting in touch with his emotions. But oftentimes it's so hard for us to do that. And so I want to give us a, a practical handle that we can do. How do we get in touch with our emotions? Now, number one, you need to spend more time to get in touch with your emotions. But spend more time doing what? Because I know I can see it already. Some of us, you're, you're going to carve out more time to spend with God. But then the extra time that you cover with God, you're just going to be stoning, right? Because you don't know what to do. How do I get in touch with my emotions? Number one, a very practical thing that we can do is to write it down. 
What do I mean? Take a piece of paper, take your phone if you want. And I want you to just start writing. And I want you to start with, God, I feel, and just start writing. But what do I, what, what if I'm not sure how I feel? Just write it down. I mean, God's not going to judge you. God's not going to grade your paper A to Z. I mean, it's, it's not going to happen. What this does is it helps us to get the ball rolling, to get the gears churning. And what happens after that is as you begin to write, I want you to read it. I want you, in fact, not just read it, but I want you to read it out loud to God. As if you're reading out your prayer that you just wrote down to God. And if it doesn't sit, write it again. I want to challenge us to do this because if you don't, or if you do, yeah, because if you try to do it any other way without engaging not just your brain, but engaging another part of your body, you're just going to get stuck in your own head and it's going to be hard to verbalize or to express what's happening on the inside. We need to start somewhere. Why is this so important? Why, why am I spending so much time on just the first point of sharing how we feel with God in order for us to keep it real? Because if we're only able to share our circumstances with God, then God will only become a circumstantial God to us. We'll only relate to Him in a circumstantial way. If we relate to God in a superficial way, and we only share superficial things, so we get in touch with some of our emotions, but we don't really go deep into the how and the why, and we don't really address it to anybody, can I tell you, God will only be a superficial God to you. You will only learn to relate to Him superficially, and you will only allow Him to relate to you superficially. And this is why it's so important for us to get in touch with our emotions and how we feel, to, to become real with God and authentic and raw. With God, because only then can we relate to God at an, at an emotional level. It's only then when God becomes an emotional God, a God of emotion, a God who is real, a God who is present, a God who is relevant. When we allow God into that space to meet with us. And so how do we do this? Again, just two things. Set aside a bit more time with God, be intentional. And number two, write it down. Write it down and review it and share it with God and allow God to come into that space. In fact, what it may do is it may actually even give you more awareness as to what it is that you're going through and how it is that you're feeling. And I want you to be diligent. Don't just write about your circumstances. Write about how you feel about it. Write about how you feel about your wife. Write about how you feel about your husband. Write about how you feel about your kids. Write about how you feel about your boss. Write about how you feel about God. I mean, you look through the passage. Again, in this passage alone, we see how he feels about God. God, I feel like you've forgotten me. God, I feel like he's sharing all of those things. In fact, on other passages, we see how he feels about his enemies, and they're not pretty. But again, he allows God into that space. But it's not enough to just share how we feel, because once, if you just stop at sharing how you feel, then it, all it becomes is a complaint session. And if you read every single one of the Psalms, it may start out with complaints, it may start out with sharing how they feel, but it always ends up with God and what God has to say about it, and a declaration of who God is. And so we can't stop with where we're just sharing how we feel. It has to bring us to the second thing, which we actually see in Psalm chapter 13, because as I mentioned, we see it all throughout the Psalms. But the second thing that we have to do after we share how we feel is we have to seek God for His help and His perspective. We have to seek God for His help and His perspective. Again, we see this in verse 3. Consider and answer me, O Lord, my God. What does this consider and answer me speak about? It speaks about this place of God. You have to answer me. You have to show up. You have to work not just on the circumstances in my life, but Lord, you have to work on the emotions in my life. And he doesn't stop with just seeking God's help. He sees God's perspective. And I think this is actually really, really critical for us because he continues, light up my eyes lest I sleep. The sleep of death. You see, the greatest help that God can give to you is a change in your perspective. It's not about a change in your circumstance that we need. It's a change in our perspective about the circumstance that we need. And this is where oftentimes we get stuck. Because when we come before God to seek Him for His help, again, that's not a bad thing to do. We should do it. But when we seek God for His help, oftentimes we're seeking Him to change our circumstance. When what we should actually do is, God, change my perspective. Light up my eyes so that I will not sleep the sleep of death. You see, if God were to change your circumstances without changing your perspective, you're still going to sleep the sleep of death. 
You're still going to get stuck. You're, still, you're not going to grow. You're not going to be able to be all that God has called you to be. You'll be stuck in the place. The, the circumstances will change again and you'll come before God in the same way and you'll ask God to do the same thing. But when you allow God to change your perspective, everything changes. You see, we need to see God's help and His perspective. And the question that we have to ask ourselves is this. Again, just to kind of do like a little reflection or an evaluation of our prayer time or, or, or our time with God. Oftentimes when you spend time with God, what do you do? Do you ask God to change your circumstances or are you asking God to change your perspective? What are we doing? Because I want to challenge us that if, you're, if majority of your time is asking God to change your circumstances, then that's got to change. You've got to ask God to change your perspective. In fact, again, let's look at Psalm 13. You look at Psalm 13, nowhere is David asking God to change his circumstances. He's only asking God to change his perspective. And then he gives praise to God. But to kind of bring this question another layer down, before we ask ourselves, what do we normally bring before God? Do we bring, ask God to change our circumstances or ask God to change our perspective? The deeper question we have to ask ourselves, though, is in a time of pain, in a time of sorrow, in a time of discomfort, in a time of uncertainty, in a time of negativity or indifference or apathy, who do we turn to? Do we even seek God? Or do we not? Because this is the challenge and this is the danger. Sometimes, when things happen in our lives, instead of pointing us to God, it pushes us away from God. Or maybe it points us to God for a season, but if it stretches too long, it ends up pushing us away from God. That's why I love this psalm, because it starts out with, how long? I'm so grateful that Josiah hasn't reached that age yet where he's asking how long before we get there. But have you ever felt like God's just taking too long to fulfill a promise? To turn things around? And so in the, in the initial stages of that, maybe that situation pushes or points us to God. But if it stretches longer and longer and we keep holding on and we keep praying and asking God for that breakthrough and we keep asking Him to change our circumstances, I mean, let, let's go really, really holy. In fact, we even start to ask God to change our perspective, but nothing changes. And then what, does, what begins to happen? Sometimes instead of continuing to point us to God, it pushes us away from God. And this is the thing that we actually need to ask. Who do we turn to in times of trouble? What do we turn to if it gets too long, if it takes too long? Do we continue to turn to God or do we turn to other things? Because as we ask ourselves this question, it brings us to another truth. Because what we turn to in a time of desperation is often a reflection of that on which we are dependent. What do I mean by this? You see, if we are desperate enough, then where will we go? It will point us towards the thing that we are most dependent on. And so if we don't turn to God, that means that we just weren't dependent on God in the first place. And we turn to our friends when God's not working in that sense. That just means that we depend more on our friends than we do on God. We turn to what the internet says or what the world says or what society says, or even what our family says as opposed to what God is saying. Ultimately, what we turn to in a time of desperation is a reflection of that on which we are most dependent. Again, this is why I love David. Because every time he reached a point of desperation, he always went to the one to whom he was most dependent. God. And so my question to us is this. Looking back, let's just use the past year as an example. Have there been times in which instead of turning to God, you've turned to something else? Because if you have, maybe it's a good point to sit up and to reflect. Have we become more dependent on that thing or that person as opposed to the one to whom we should be turning to? God. And so two things that we've looked at so far. Number one, we need to share how we feel with God if we want to keep the fire burning. Number two, after we share how we feel, though, we need to see God's help and perspective 
on the issue and the thing at hand. But number three, the third thing that we need to do if we want to keep the fire burning is we need to then steady ourselves in God's character. You see, after we see God for His help and His perspective, oftentimes what God begins to change in our perspective is that we should not be looking at our uncertain circumstances. Rather, we should be looking at God's certain character. And when we begin to experience this shift, and the more we begin to fix our eyes on the character of God, the unchanging character of God, that begins... That becomes a thing that anchors us in the ever-changing circumstances. That's the thing that actually steadies us in our life. Again, look at the scripture. It says, but I have trusted in your steadfast love. And my heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Now, what changed his response? What changed the way that he felt? Because he was no longer just feeling sorrow, now he was feeling joy and he was rejoicing. What brought about that change was that he began to change his focus. His focus was no longer on his circumstances, it was on the character of God. And the way in which this happens is that it has to be an intentional shift that we have to make. We have to say, God, I know that these things are happening. I know that these things are bringing me down. But God, I choose to fix my eyes on you. I choose to allow your character and your nature to determine my response as opposed to the circumstances which have yet to change. What will we allow into our lives to steady us? Will it be the circumstances which will change with the wind? Or will it be the nature of God and the character of God which never changes? You see, how was David able to keep it real with God? Every time he came before God, he always shared how he felt. He always sought God's help and God's perspective. And he always brought himself back to the character of God. The unchanging character of God. You see, when you, want to, when you allow your circumstances to dictate how you feel, then if the circumstances don't change, you'll forever be stuck. But what God is calling us to, and what God has continuously shown us in His Word, is that our feelings don't have to be dictated by our circumstances because they are determined by the character of God. The question is, are we allowing the character of God to determine how we feel? And I think this is where it gets so difficult. In fact, we don't just see it in the Psalms. We see it even in Lamentations. And if you haven't guessed, the book of Lamentations is a pretty depressive book. Uh, it's a time in which the prophet Jeremiah just laments. I mean, he's just lamenting and lamenting and lamenting. But I find it interesting because when you read Lamentations chapter 3, verse 19 to 24, he says this, Remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall, my soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me. Now, I don't know, I want you to stop there. That is a pretty depressive prayer at the moment. It's like everything is bleak, everything is dim. If you can just help me with the slides. But, but Lamentation chapter 3. And it's okay to feel like that when it comes to God. But I like how he stops himself after his complaint and he changes his focus and he says, but... Again, underline that word, but I, this I call to mind. And therefore I have hoped the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in Him. Now I want you to notice this. Most of us are familiar with the second part of this passage. We know the song, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning, new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, oh God. Did you know that this was written not in a time of, not in a positive time, not in a good time? It was written in a time of lamentation. It was written when the prophet was at his lowest. It was his butt. He acknowledged the situation he was in. He acknowledged the feelings that were stirring within his heart and they were dark. And then in the midst of all of that, he stops himself. And he says, but this I call to mind. 
The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies, they never come to an end, even though I haven't seen it yet. They are new every morning. Even though my circumstances haven't changed, even though this, this deep sorrow that I feel in my heart has not been lifted, great is your faithfulness, O Lord. And because of that, I will put my hope in Him. You see, church, what is God calling us to do? How is God calling us to relate to Him in such a time as this? He wants us to be real with Him so that we, He can be real with us. How do we feel? With this, the worship team can just come up and join me. Where are we at in this space with God right now? Are you tired? Are you weary? Can I encourage us, don't stop there. But can you begin to tell God why you feel tired? Why you feel weary? Why, why am I saying this again? Because sometimes I feel like if we, if we only say, God, I'm tired. God, I, God I'm worried. And we don't go deeper. That's a superficial kind of being real. Like you're real, but you're not deep real. And I just sense that even as we start this series and, and as we talk about what it looks like to keep the fire burning, that God has a deep yearning in His heart to be as real as He can be with us. But all He's waiting for is for us to be deeply real with Him. Now what does that look like? You have to set aside time to be real with God. I, I remember I remember when, when we had, before Josiah was born and I mean, we had the miscarriage and then we were told that actually we weren't, we weren't able to have children and, and all these kind of different things were happening. I, I remember there was a moment where I was just spending time with God and, and I was thinking about what was happening and, and how we may not have children and, and how maybe the only option was to adopt or to foster. And, and I remember God asking me how I felt about it. Very, very quickly, I, I told God, God, you know what? I know you're good and I know that your, your love is, is always there and I know that you're faithful and I know that your word stands true. And I know that we can still be parents in another way and, and that your will will be accomplished no matter what. And I remember just sharing all of those things with God and and in the midst of all of that, God stopped me in my tracks and said, no, 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 no. That's not what I'm asking. I'm asking you how you feel. And I continue, I, I tell you, it must have gone on for a bit longer than usual because I said the same thing in another way. I said, God, I know that you're faithful. I know that you're true. I know that, you know, you, your ways are higher than my ways. Your thoughts are higher than, than my thoughts. And I don't understand it, but but I place my trust in you. He stopped me again. No, 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 no. You're not hearing me right. I, that's not what I'm asking. I'm asking, how do you feel? And on hindsight now, I know what he was trying to get at then. Because I had skipped all the way to step three, setting myself and the character of God. Without first coming to the place of just allowing myself to be known by God and how I felt. And it took me a while to get it because as God continued to speak, uh, it was just a lot of back and forth and finally I told God, God, I'm tired. God, I'm done. God, I don't understand because God, I, I feel like you don't listen and I feel like you don't care because you know, here I am slaving away in your kingdom and then you're not blessing me. God, I feel a little bit scam. I feel like you're the number one scam artist because God, I've seen some people out there who are not living godly lives and Lord, you've blessed them with children that have come out from an ungodly behavior. 
And God, here I am, and I'm doing all these things, and I don't see it, and I don't feel it. In fact, God, I'm done. If this is the way it's going to be, God, I don't know if I want to do it anymore because, God, I, I just can't see it going past that. And as I begin to share all those things with God, all of a sudden, it was like the gentle whisper of God saying, that's what I want. Because when you understand where you're at, then and only then can you understand who I can be in that situation. And it was in that moment, it was as if something broke. And can I tell you, even after that time, there have been times in my time with God where we had to go through the whole gamut again. Because it's so easy to skip the steps, to steady myself in God's character before I first allow myself to be known by Him. And so my question and my challenge to us today is will you keep it real with God? Will you allow God into that space? Will you be willing to set aside time to dig deep enough so that you can even discover and rediscover what that space looks like again? Because I look across the room, in fact, I look across our nation and the world today. The one thing we don't have is time to reflect. It's time to dig deep. It's time to just reflect and to meditate and to, and to get in touch with what's really going on on the inside. We're so quick to cover it up. We're so quick to ignore it. We're so quick to push it aside. We're so quick to numb ourselves with Netflix or with Disney Plus or, or with going out and with the routines. Why? Because sometimes it's just too painful to get in touch with that. Sometimes we've just forgotten how to get in touch with it. But God hasn't. God wants to be real to us in a way where we can be real with Him. And I feel like maybe there are some of us here, maybe you're going through a difficult time and you've been praying and you've been seeking God and, and a lot of it has it's revolved around your circumstances. In the next few moments, will you present and set aside some time with God to just share with Him how you feel. It may, it may sound weird the moment it comes out of your mouth, but I tell you, you're going to be on the right track. You may even ask yourself, I don't know if I can even say this to God. You can. That's the space He wants. And so God, we come before you today and and God, we thank you that, Lord, you desire to be real to us. God, we thank you because, God, you desire to, to know our innermost thoughts and our innermost feelings. And, and God, we present ourselves before you because sometimes it's just so hard for us to get in touch with what's going on on the inside. God, sometimes we're so used to, to the way we've done it all these years where we just go through the textbook checklist and, and we tick it off one by one and, and yet we've ignored the things which are hiding underneath. And God, right now, we just want to pray for each and every one of us. God, I pray that you will teach us and you will help us to peel back the layers so that we can invite you into that space again. And so we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now what we're going to do is this. We're going to have the time of response in a very different way today. 
Because as we've just spoken about, the one of the things that God desires is that we keep it real with Him. Not just sometimes, not just once in a while, but all the time. And as we mentioned and as we've established over the course of this time together, it's, it's hard to get real with God. It's hard to just get in touch. It's, it's hard even not just to get real with God, it's hard to get real with ourselves. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give us some time to get real with Him. Some time to get real with our soul. And I'm just going to leave us one question. The question is this. It's as if God is just asking, how do you feel? Where are you at? And so as the worship team just begins to, to play in, in the background, Wherever you are, we just set aside some time. If you have your phone, if you have your pen or a piece of paper, whatever it may be. I want to encourage us to just begin to write down or to type out how we feel or what we're going through and, and where we're at. What we talked about earlier, just to share our feelings with God and to allow Him into that space. And so I'm just going to pray for us and then after that, I'll give us some time to just do that together before we close our time. And so God, we pray that, Lord, you will help us to be sensitive to how we feel. Lord, if we've closed off those doors, if we've become numb to it, Lord, if we've forgotten what it looks like and, and how to verbalize it, God, I pray that you'll give us the right words and, and you'll, you'll help us to, to have a deeper insight as to what is going on, whether it's in relation to our family, in relation to our work, and maybe it's even in relation to our own walk with you, but But God, to be uncensored in the sharing of where we're at with your Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So come on, wherever we are, just begin to spend the next few moments. Just write it down or type it out. <laughs>